I want to talk to you today about twisted message title for today is the root of all evil. The root of all evil. This is our last installment of the sermon series entitled Twisted. The word we're looking at is verses in the Bible that are commonly misinterpreted, misused, or twisted. And if you have a wrong interpretation of scripture, you're going to have a wrong theology. And therefore teach the wrong things in the Bible. In week one, we spoke about our prayer life. And Jesus says in John 14, if you ask anything in my name, it will be done unto you, I'll give it to you. We understand that there's a lot more to our prayer life than just asking God for something and expecting Him to deliver. It also incorporates your relationships, your faith, your motives for prayer, and also the will of God. And then in week two, we spoke about do not judge or you will be judged. And often one quoted by non-believers. They, they might not know anything on the Bible, but boy, they'll quote that one. Do not judge or you will be judged. We also understand that at face value it might sound like that. But in context of Scripture, we understand that it's not as easy as that. Jesus actually did give us authority to judge, but to judge correctly. We must not judge superficially by mere appearances. We must not judge hypocritically. That's the most important one. That's the whole context of that chapter. We must not judge non-Christians by Christian standards. The Bible says, Paul says, do not judge those outside the church. God will judge those. You judge those inside the church. It gives us authority to then judge one another as Christians, as brothers and sisters. But the problem there is that we must do it gently, with a lot of love and a lot of grace. Too many churches nowadays are, 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 are I would say, too harsh on the members and the Christians in their church. As soon as they do something wrong, step out of line, they immediately excommunicate and suspend it or send home for six months or nine months or whatever. And that's just wrong. The, the Bible definitely says that we should restore believers gently, show them a lot of love, a lot of grace, as we restore them back to their former glory. And then last week we looked at thanks to prosper. We understand that uh, the Jeremiah 29 11 says, uh, for the plans I have for you, says the, the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you. And we look at that and think, well, that's a promise for us, for us as a church, as Christians. God wants us to prosper and He never wants to harm us. It's all about health and wealth. We understand that we're looking at that passage, it was a specific promise for a specific people. Jeremiah wrote that to the Holy Spirit, divine inspired, for a specific purpose to the Jewish exiles who were in Babylon. And it was a promise to them. God said, I will bring you back from your exile in 70 years, and I will prosper you again, and I will defend you, and I will protect you from the enemies around you. I will let no harm come to you. So that verse is not a specific one to you. The church is one to the people of Israel. What we should be worried about as Christians is not pursuing wealth and prosperity, but pursuing the presence of Almighty God. Because it's in His presence that we'll overcome the trials and tribulations that we're going through. And so if we're assuming wealth and health and prosperity, when those things disappoint us, we kind of look to God and say, well, God, you're not a good, good father like the song says. Why do we say that? Because of a faulty interpretation of Scripture. Today we're looking at our last verse. It's one that is the most misquoted verse in the Bible, and then one of the most misinterpreted verses in the Bible. Let's look at that verse. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. You may have heard that quote before. Misquoted because people miss out the first part. Often I've heard people say money is the root of all evil. It's a misquote. It's not in the Bible. The Bible says that the love of money, the pursuit of money, is the result of all kinds of evil. So I might ask you the question, well, are you included in that verse? You might say, that's not for me. Uh, well, you're really saying that's not for me. That's for Bill Gates, that's for John, that's for the cream. The rich people, the greedy people. Well, how do we discern if we love money or not? Well, the Bible actually tells us. Let's look at a verse in the Bible in Ecclesiastes. I'd love to ask you who wrote that book. Solomon. Solomon. 500 bucks in your account of the church. <laughs> Solomon, the wise old bitter. Solomon, Solomon wrote this. And he says this, whoever loves money, never has money in life. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is means. So here's my two questions for you. How much money would you need to live a little bit more happier, a little bit more easier, a little bit more comfortable? Suppose most of you say, yeah, a little bit more, Randy. I think in two months, Randy, yeah, a little bit more than that also, and a little bit more than that. Be, be honest, we're never satisfied. Whatever we get, 
where we get something and we never sell so we just want a little bit more, a little bit more. For those of you who are employed and have an employer, I think that first, that second part of the wind is a bit too, too close, doesn't it? It says that, well, these never satisfied with your income. Let me ask you a second question for those of you who work. Are you satisfied with your income? In, obviously not. And don't lie in the church. <laughs> no one is ever satisfied with the income. Nobody. I, I, I've been working up for 24 years and everybody I spoke to is never satisfied. Even my wife is not satisfied with me, not being satisfied with getting money. That's how bad it is. Every couple of months, they talk to your boss. You know what? You grab it, you need more money. <laughs> That's what happens. You're never satisfied with the income. So you saw that verse in 1 Timothy 16 and said, ah, the, the, the root of all kinds of money, the, the root of, uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And then you said, no, this is not for me. Some of you really shook your heads. But now maybe it is bringing a bit too close home to comfort. Maybe this message is for you, the church, today. So let's look at what we're going to do. We're going to look at uh, the, the sermon structure, which is called a textual message. We're going to look at the passage of 1 Timothy 6, and we're going to get out the interpretation and the application from that. I promise you that we wouldn't do the rules of interpretation again, so we're not going to do that structure, which is uh, context, scripture, and application. But in this message, we're going to still understand the context and the scripture. Sorry. Sorry, Rob. Rob, sorry. Uh, Rob. You're on about the love for money. Yes. But is maybe the love for money, but there's a need for money. Yes. I mean, I might not love money, but I might need yeah. it to, just to make sure that I live within my budget. That's fine, and you're 100% right. Rob, you're going to come up and share the message with us? Or? <laughs> <laughs> just something that I'm so, uh, you are missing what? It's not, uh, uh, we need money. Yeah. But we're going to get to that. You said, I'm going to get to jump there now because we're jumping out. But we need money. Money is not evil. We need money to sustain ourselves, to, to live, to survive. And, and Rob's hundred said, right. He said that it's not the love of money, it's a need for money. And that's what we need. But, but we must be careful as Christians in our pursuit and need for money, we don't jump over mm-hmm. and stop pursuing yeah. well. That's what this message is about. Christians who have a need for money but jump the gun and start just pursuing that wealth and you're greedy, you're greedy and not letting you contain it in your needs. Well done, Rob. Next week, I'm out of here. I'm taking a break. Rob is going to come in show us. Thank you, Rob. God bless you. So what we're going to do today is look at three points. Our first point is godliness and contentment. Let's look at the verses. Um, as before, the rules of interpretation is context. So we read verse 10. We're going to read the first couple of verses. 6 to 8. Yet true godliness with contentment is in itself great wealth. After all, we bought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. You've heard that before, haven't you? So, if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. You see, the, the message, the theme in this passage is not money, it's godliness. Paul is trying to teach Christians how to be godly. And in this money comes up because there were rich people in the church, like we are today. And he'll say, well, godliness with contentment is great wealth. You don't need money and wealth to be rich because you really got great wealth when you're just content with what you have, food and clothing. And that's why we just can't wrap our heads around it. Our heads might understand it, but our hearts now, and we're going to get that. Can you be content with food and clothing? Or is it food and clothing and an iPhone? Or is it food and clothing and Netflix? You know, we, we're never satisfied with anything. Even our iPhones, we're not satisfied and content with that because we need WhatsApp. And then we're not content with that because we need YouTube. We're never content with anything. We always want food and clothing and something and something and something. Paul said, just be content with those two things. And you know, it, it, it troubles us as Christians. It burdens us and we get worried and uh, perturbed about it when we see struggling Christians in other developing nations. They have nothing. They got no running water, no electricity, no flushing toilets. And I know we can't struggle in the same way you make today with those things, but it's situational. I'm talking about those countries that are developing countries, and there's Christians living there with nothing. They haven't got any water, or, or they're just very content with their food and their clothing. And we from these developed nations, we get them and say, how is this possible? How can you be content just living like that? And I understood something very important. The rich aren't those who have much. The rich are those who need the least. Let me say that again. The rich aren't those who have enough. 
the rich are those who need the least. And when we talk to these Christians in these developing nations, we are worried because we see that they might not have anything. They can't take with their food and clothing, but they have joy and they have peace and they have faith and the assurance of faith and courage like you and I will never have had in our life. And that's what worries us because here we are, we got everything. And I'm telling you, we don't have 10% of what those people have. We used to feed the homeless in John Street a couple of years ago. Really missed doing that. But we used to feed them and we used to always bother me when I spoke to these guys. These were homeless people. They had nothing. And they used to always say how good God was and he thanks God for saving them and how great this is. They're so thankful for what they got today. And I'm thinking, are you crazy? You don't have anything. You don't even have a roof over your head. Then I understood this principle. The rich aren't those who have enough, but the rich are those who need the least. And you know, I wish I had 10% of their faith and their joy and their peace and contentment. Because I would be a far better Christian today than I ever was. Because I don't understand this principle. Godliness was contentment. It's great wealth. Let's read the next one. Love and money. Well, this is the verse beyond. Let's read it. 9 and 10, it says this. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. This is what I was talking about earlier with God. Fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves in many things. He's talking to Christians. Rich Christians who were in pursuit of money, but they kind of went the other way. And so not just being content with what they have and, and using their stuff to bless others and just what they need. They, they, they fell into all snares and traps. And if you read this, it's a lot of negative terminology. Did, did you pick them up? Um, temptation, snare traps, harmful desires, ruin, destruction, all kinds of evil, uh, piercing themselves with pains and troubles and tribulations. Man, that's like horrible words. We might immediately think that money is bad. As I said before, money is not bad. It's the love of money that's bad. We all need money. This is what it's all about. And it's the, the rich will fall into this temptation of going the other way. In the Christian world, in, in the church world, there, there's two gospels that are preaching churches. I spoke about one briefly last week. It was to do with finances and wealth. It's called the prosperity gospel. If you don't know that, please look it up sometime. Uh, on Google, it's called the Prosperity Gospel. This is a belief that is preaching churches today by many of the big mega churches. It's the idea that if you want to be godly, you have to be rich. Just like Jeremiah 29, uh, 11 says that God wants to prosper you and give you wealth and health and prosperity. That's a false doctrine. It's not a biblical gospel. Man. These are false teachers, false prophets, false apostles preaching a false doctrine in the church. And then you get the other extreme, which is called the poverty gospel. That's something that we might relate to, right? <laughs> the poverty gospel. Now this is just the opposite. There are Christians out there that believe that we should have nothing and then be God. And if you have anything, if you have a car or a house or a nice clothes, Nike takes, you're ungodly, you're unrighteous, you unholy. So these are the two gospels being propagated in the church today, the prosperity gospel and the poverty gospel, and both are incorrect. Both is a very gross misuse of the scriptures, abuse of the scriptures, and furthermore an abuse to the people that they're preaching to. They're abusing those people in the church because the idea in these churches is if you give more to the church, you'll get more. And they become very wealthy. The church becomes like this, uh, bigger than Google and bigger than all these big companies. And the ministers that are preaching that gospel become that they have got four houses and then holiday homes and airplanes and, and helicopters and it's just kind of ridiculous because they're preaching this into the gospel. We as Christians should not fall into the ditches of either one of these excuses, but keep the high road. Understand that money is not evil. We need it. It's a need. And we can be rich within your means. But understand that it's not only about the money and the pursuit of money itself. Because being rich is not a bad thing. Let me show you the verse in the Bible. Deuteronomy. The good News Bible. Anybody know the Good News Bible? Yeah, I don't know my favorite Bible. I started the church with the Bible. Remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the power or the ability to become rich or the ability to be wealthy. Isn't that an awesome verse right there for you? 
rich people in the church, I mean, you know who you are, all right? <laughs> the, the guilty people in the church, that you know who you are. <laughs> and you're looking at that. God gave you the power or the ability to become rich. So wealth is not bad. Being rich is not evil. God gave you the ability and the power and the knowledge sense, the business sense, whatever it is, to accumulate that wealth and riches. As long as you don't pursue that wealth and riches, as long as you keep your heart focused on God and understand that that ability came from God, so you must give Him the glory and the thanks. Thank you, God, for giving me the ability to create this wealth. And you know what, God? This is not about me. This is about other people. So I'm going to give what I have, and I'm going to bless others with what you have given me. And that's kind of where this message will eventually fall on. Because our third point is good and generous. Good and generous. Everybody say good and generous. Good and generous. Let's read verses. Verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth. Not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. We know that stock markets all stuff up and down. But to put and COVID and uh, retrenchment, all that stuff, it all falls into that uncertain world. But to put their hope in who? God. Hope in God, who richly provides everything for enjoyment. So God gives the power to make money. Good. If you're rich, God bless you. And He gives it for your entertainment, for your enjoyment, all of that stuff He richly provides. Come on, those who are rich. And immediately He left it back. He said, That's not me. Look, He said, That's not me. Rich. Uh, not talking to me. Come on, those who are rich. Put a pen into your cell phone. All of you got a cell phone. Don't lie. Right now, thousands of rings worth of technology in your purses and pockets. Put up again if you own a motor vehicle, an automobile, a car. Put up again if you own a car. Be honest, all of you own a car, then you said, then you. Do you know what? If you own your own car, according to one article, you are within the top 10% of the wealthiest people on this planet. Top 10. Put up your hand again, please, so those that have cars, just put up your hand and just keep them up for a second. The rest of you people, look at these guys, because they're the rich guys. <laughs> <laughs> So now we know who you're talking to me, man. Talk to 10% of the wealthiest people on this planet. If you own a car, you know what really gets me? What's funny about this is that we have our cars in our top 10% wealthiest cars. I, I feel guilty. Damn straight, yeah. Damn straight. We have these. We have, we have these top percent, top percent wealthy cars, in, and there's no restaurants in Newton except we go to PE to look for restaurants because we can afford to eat out. And we want to stay in restaurants. We stop at a restaurant and look at the menu, and, and we can't even decide what to get on this menu, so we decide to just get anything. And then when the waiter brings it 15 minutes later, we complain about this thing that we didn't want to get anyway. And then we get back into our top 10% wealthiest cars and we come back home to our climate controlled homes because some of us have aircons. And that's what uh, they all the guilty people, so we sweat, man. <laughs> and then we sit back and we watch Netflix on our wall mountain. Flat screen TV, which I know you all have. <laughs> and then we retire, we sleep, we wake up and we go to our cupboards, we open them up, and now oh, the girls have so much clothes in those cupboards. Dresses and skirts and tops and tops. So much that stuff can even fall into the floor and you don't even pick it up because you don't, you can't really be bothered with it. Some of you have walk in closets. Have you ever seen those before? You walk in, it's like a room, full of clothes. The men are the same. We have all our clothes and our shirts and our jeans and our shoes. And after 15 minutes of looking in that cupboard, we stand back in the conclusion, I don't know what to wear. <laughs> Come on, those who are rich. Let me tell you what you didn't know when you walked in this morning. You are rich. You are stinking rich. And you fall right part of this message. Paul is talking to Christians who are rich. And you know, if you look at some people who are struggling out there, and after what I've said now, let's be honest, I've probably hit the nail on the head, and I'm probably mentioning about 8% of this church, where some of those things that I've just mentioned. And if that's you, yes, you're rich. Come on, those who are rich. And here's the key, that with all that I've just said, I'm not saying that it's there and make me feel guilty. God bless you. You work hard for that stuff. I've got a nice house, I've got a car, uh, my wife goes hard for that man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'll say that again. <laughs> Some of you have nice wine in our house, and that's great. God bless you, and God gave you the ability to make that well. But don't put your hope in that glass. I love you so much. Love you, my angel. Don't put your hope in the well. Don't put your hope in the things of this world. Don't put your hope in the money. Who must you put your hope in? There's another verse that I want to end on. That's in the second part of this verse. Let me read that to you. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Who is he talking to Christians? He's talking to those who are rich. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He says, command them first to not put their hope in wealth. And yes, a command. I like that word command. It's not a, a guideline. Paul wasn't saying to Timothy, get a, a, a meeting together and talk to the rich people and see if they can accommodate. Them. No, he says, command those who are rich in the church. A straight out commandment. And what is the command? To do good. To be rich in good deeds. To be generous and willing to share. It can't be more simple than that. As the rich people in this church, you know who you are. This is a commandment from God to you today. To be good, rich in good deeds. To be generous and willing to share. And this is where we kind of fall flat. And I'm not saying that you you uh, greedy and all that. It's just that we, we can't share. We, we struggle to share. Especially nowadays. Uh, our trust for people is to play out the window. We can't give to anybody. We live in a world where... We, we, we don't want to share. Maybe not because we really, it's just because we don't trust where this money is going to. Same as churches. And this is not a church. This is not about tithes and offerings. This is not about helping me or the church. This is about helping other people. People come to church and they give. You don't, you don't even trust your money in the church because you don't know where it's going to. It's the same story with this. And, and we just we, we struggle with it. Maybe we're too self centered. We get just go, I don't know what it is. But we don't want to share no more. We don't want to even share our faith. Our faith. Jesus died to save you and me. He died and he bred and he said, Raymond, I've saved you. Please go out and share this great gospel, this great message that there are saved people. And we don't do that. We just don't want to share our faith. Why? I don't know. We don't want to share our passions and our gifts. Some of you in this church have wonderful gifts. Singing, drawing, leadership, whatever it is, public speaking. But man, you will not share this gift with the world. Yeah, sure, you've got a beautiful voice and you sing in the shower, great. But it's not that, it's not helping anybody, it's, it's not reaching anymore. Some of you have great artistic ability and, and you, you're drawing these pictures in this dark room in the back of your house, not letting anybody see them. Some of you are great with words and poetry and literature. Why aren't you sharing that with the world? You just don't want to share them. The same applies to our wealth and our riches. We just don't want to share them. Well, the message today is simply that you've got to be good, you've got to be generous, and you've got to be willing to share. Highlight somebody outside of this church that you know that is struggling, that you know that is in need. And can you take a little bit of the riches that God has given you, the power to accumulate, and can you put it aside and say, I'm going to bless this person, even be it anonymously. I'm going to bless this person because God has blessed me. And I want to live by this command that God has given me to be willing to share. And this is not in the church. I'm talking about people outside the church. I'm talking about people who really need your help today. Can you reach out and help them today? Don't wait another moment, another day, another month. If you know this person is in dire straits and needs your needs a little bit of financial gain, even if it isn't financial, even if it's just a plate of food or some food out of your cupboard, put it in a parcel and put it by the stoop of the gate of the house. Just be willing, willing to share. Can we just be good in rich in good deeds and generous? We gotta get out of this idea that we can't trust anybody and all people are criminals and all people are drug addicts and they're gonna be wasting my money on diet. I don't give up only who you give because they need. You give because you want to understand this command. You gotta be willing to share with those who need. Can we take a little bit of the riches that God has given us? 
just a little bit only, you can share it with others. Maybe this message is not for those rich people like Bill Gates and Donald Trump. Maybe this message is for you in this church today. Can you do that? Can you be willing to share? And maybe we'll understand that it's not money that is the root of all the Amen.